the podcast shall start Here we immediately. Go. Here we go. Lance has a great Southern preacher voice. No, I really don't. Yes, you do. And I think it should come out at some point. Maybe if you start feeling your oats. Maybe you start feeling frisky in this here podcast. I feel podcast. like I need to sit Guys, forward. guys. What? We're live. Oh. <laughs> We're live. See, this is what it's like. Everybody asks, what the, what's it like? working at the fly fishing superstore and it's just like that it's like We're that show fun super By everybody store. you mean one person yeah so <laughs> so we're having fun and curtis has to rein us in 24 7. anyway where did you find that what um don't worry guys i just need to show there that. we so go yeah you do need to show me <laughs> now he's got my fingerprints all over his ipad oh device. great well, here we is, are. What episode? This is episode 12? 12. 12. Holy crap. We really killed it there for a while. We're going nuts. Yeah. So uh, we took a little break because of, what did we take a break from? Well, we did some other filming last week yeah. or the week before. Yeah. So we're back on the on the wagon, even though Curtis has in display a disgusting Boca Jr. sticker on his water bottle. Mm. Oh, what? Turn that Mm. It's an Argentinian soccer team. <laughs> I have a funny story about Argentinian soccer teams and how they got me out of a ticket. That we need to tell that story to begin with. Okay. Okay. We'll start this. We'll start with the story, and then uh, the rest of this podcast basically will be Lance talking, and then we're gonna just make. Faces we're gonna out. say, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Lance, that sounds really effective. What about if I use the door panel leader on that? I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, so we're going out to Whiting Farms. Yeah. And um, I see a trooper pull out in front of us, like from what a half mile away, or maybe further away. It was yeah. he was away off, a ways off, and I'm like, what? He wouldn't tag us. Yeah. So I approach very cautiously from behind the trooper, and then once we start to get a little closer, he pulls off to the side of the road, and as I go by, he, he lights you he, up. He lit me up. Son of a... So, anyway, um, Trooper comes up to the, the window, and uh, he didn't even play that. Do you know why I pulled you no. over again? He just said, you approach me going 80 miles an hour. But more importantly, let's talk about this river plate sticker you got me the window. <laughs> so... He proceeded to talk to us about Argentinian soccer and Patagonia and stuff like that. Long story short, my truck needs to be recalibrated. For sure. We for were speed. Out. Yeah. I did some math and calculated it. Yeah, it only took him like four hours to figure <laughs> it out. I had to find the right formula. <laughs> yeah. So we did some nerd math, but I got a warning. He told us to slow down. But when he came up to the window, he said, Por qué ustedes son mis hermanos? I'm going to yeah. give you a warning. No warning. Yes. All right. That's it. That's all we, I got to contribute. Yeah, that was good. I was scared. So I think we chose this topic because we get asked to do this like every time we do a podcast, regardless of whether or not we say it's a Q and A. Um, we get lots of questions about Euro nymphing, tight line nymphing, and stuff like that. Sure. So and because Lance is leaving to Tasmania Saturday, is that in Europe somewhere? Really like close, by, really south of there. Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia? Southwest. Yeah, it's yeah. one of those. I think it's one right between those. the two. The USSR. Yeah. What other countries don't exist anymore? All right. uh, Istanbul. <laughs> no, that's a city, not Constantinople. <laughs> right. Um. Ooh. You have audio playback? Yeah, I can hear it somewhere. Is it here? Could be. And you might need to get a little closer. I can do that. Can you... So what we're going to do, we have a list of questions we posted on the socials that we could have, and we've got some coming in live mm-hmm. as we speak. Yes, we have. Already, <laughs> there's already enough to talk for like two hours. We already have two people that said that's Lance Egan right there. So my job here is done. <laughs> well, you did get your job done early because for once you opened your soda before the podcast even started. 
This is brought to you by Diet Coke. Kelly uh, Barnes, take note. Kelly Barnes yelled at me that I drink too many energy drinks, and he's right. So I do appreciate everybody who's bringing me Purple Monsters, the ultraviolets, but this is my second soda of the day, and that's that's a And that's drink. neither of which would be an energy drink, correct? No. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's basically an energy drink. I've been in a bad mood for like 48 hours. In and a, a shout-out, by the way, to whoever it was that brought us the Dr. Peppers. Yeah. What? There was another nice. Dr. Pepper delivery? No, that was between last episode and this. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Very nice people uh, bringing us snacks and goodies. I also just found out that Lance has a secret stash of chocolate downstairs. Whoa. He, he says has had. <laughs> it's all gone. <laughs> well, it might have reduced by 50%, but it's still there. I don't think there's anything left. I'm going to take a picture of it and put it on Instagram. Please so if do. you come to our shop, you'll know where to get the chocolate. The funny part is that uh, the secret stash has been there. You notice what kind of candy it was? Easter candy. Easter candy, because I don't eat chocolate. <laughs> I left it was at home for a couple months. I don't eat it there, so I thought I'd bring it here, and I still don't eat it. Oh, my God. But Cheech, he'll take care of that for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Jeez. Let's Somebody get into Lance's it. The game needs to go up to the time. Okay. Right. I'll make this closer. That's, well, the, that's the issue. You gotta eat the microphone. I can I can thing. crawl under the table and bump it up if we want. Is right. that better? Can you guys hear me better? That is yeah. better. Yeah. Well, how about what do you want to talk about first, Lance? What's the first question that you want to? I don't know. We're gonna discuss. get so many. We're not gonna be able to keep track of them all. Oh uh, yeah, that's another thing. That's a good good question. So I don't know. Where should we start? Uh, we asked for questions online on Facebook yeah. and Instagram, so we have kind of a list that uh, we have in front of us here to try and keep us on track. We also have them live on our live chat. Um, we'll try and get to as many as we can. We definitely will not have time for all of them. So we apologize if we don't get to yours, but... Uh, we'll, we'll do a part two. Part two, there you go. Yep. Part two. So I think uh, first, well, there is a question that kind of leads into a good intro, and that is, how did you get into competition angling? How did I get into competition angling? Well, Team USA, I got involved with after uh, participating in the ESPN Great Outdoor Games. Uh, I won the ESPN Great Outdoor Games two times in a row and uh, competed against some guys that had done Team USA competitions. And then Team USA at that time was going through a transition where they wanted to go from I would call good old boys network to trying to have more legit mm -hmm. um, competitors. And I got actually involved with Team USA kind of in that transition where I just got invited, but then the next year they made us all start going through the regional and national process and started having a point system and so on. So I got involved with it just, uh, I started competing, I guess, uh, ESPN Great Outdoor Games, and really I started competing with casting first, casting competitions. But then uh, that migrated, you know, just a quick answer, into fishing competitions. And uh, I've been doing them since. There you go. <clears throat> How are we doing on audio? Do I need to bump him? Um, Jared says it might sound a little fuzzy. I was trying to text you this so we didn't have to have oh. this conversation, <laughs> but you don't ever check your phone. Not during the middle of a podcast. Not in the middle of a, a podcast. Um, what else do we have? So... So I think that, you know, there are two elements of this discussion. We talk, we're talking about Euro nymphing, mm -hmm. right, which is the technique, but then there's the competition side of it, which involves a completely other side of fishing that, that maybe is, is something that we don't think about when we go out and fish because we're not trying to maximize our time on the water. We're just kind of enjoying being out, being out in nature. Yes. Right? So let's say when I get skunked. Just nice to get out. So maybe the audio is uh, jacked. Just FYI, it, it is jacked. Mm -hmm. How do we fix it? I'm looking at it. So keep talking. Curtis is trying to fix the audio. So thanks for your uh, concerns. How many episodes do we have now to get it right? <laughs> Seventeen, twenty-seven, something like that. Uh, let's talk about your your leaders. I mean, people talk ask about the leaders. What I've noticed is thick versus thin. When are you gonna? What leader are you gonna use for uh, like just nymphing versus throwing a streamer versus the dry fly rig that you use every once in a while? 
Yeah, so I think uh, maybe to back up one step, it's worth mentioning that uh, in competition, some people seem to be under the impression that in competition, all you can do is nim, which is not at all the case. You can fish drives, streamers, nymphs, dry droppers, wet flies, and we fish lakes in competitions a lot. Uh, so there's, you know, it's it's not a one trick pony kind of a thing. It's try and get as good at all, as many techniques as possible. So we use all kinds of, of situations and all kinds of uh, rigging and techniques. So it's hard to answer every question with like this is the way you do it because like all techniques, there isn't there's no such thing as the right answer for every situation. It all varies on place and time and time of year and, and the fish and so on. Um, but I guess to move into maybe leaders, I mean, when, when would you use leaders? For me, I'm usually using, uh, I'm using really thin, what we call micro thin leaders these days for nymphing. Uh, I also use them for a jig streamer on a, on a nymph rig. For most of my clients, I'm using a, wow, that got loud all of a sudden, Curtis. Yeah, that sounds good. I don't know if it's still fuzzy, but it's, it's tell us, louder at least. Tell us on the uh, on the comments if, if this is good. So anyway, for people that are getting started in Euro nymphing, we usually recommend a heavier leader, a thicker leader, if you will. It makes turnover a little easier. It has more control, so you have more directional control. And when you come from a, a background of which we all do for fly fishers of tapered leader setups, whether you're dry fly fishing, nymph fishing, whatever, you're kind of used to the way that that kicks over. So if we start somebody immediately with a micro thin leader, I tell them to cast over there and they cast 20 feet this way. And uh, when you're trying to put flies in you know micro zones, tight the bank and avoid overhangs and that kind of stuff, that's a no go. So we always recommend people start with a thicker leader and then gradually. You know, graduate, if you will, or, or let your fishing kind of evolve to get thinner and thinner through the year. Uh, the most cutting edge stuff in competition right now that I've been exposed to is very uh, thin leaders, so 4x to even 6x as your main main leader line. That's crazy, and, and it's, it is tough to cast like that. It's too. An, it takes really a lot of practice. To cast. And then uh, the tippet, you know, side or tippet wing, and uh, tippet from there. I'm mostly fishing one right now that's about 4x diameter. Now, just so we're not confusing people, we're not using 4x tippet. It's not actually tippet material. It's just that diameter. Um, but those are really hard to cast. When I get even my really experienced clients, and I, uh, you know, halfway through the day, say, "Hey, you want to try something new?" And they, you know, they're fishing something that's maybe not a 20 pound butt section, but let's say even a 12 or 10 pound butt section. When I've tried to have them use the the really micro thin leader, within 20 minutes they usually ask to go back to the other system because it's really that hard to cast. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so that's kind of what we're doing with leaders there as far as dry flies and all that kind of stuff goes. In competition, you can basically bet on everything being longer than you're used to. Longer rods, longer leaders, longer tippets, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Dry fly leaders, um, we tend to fish, you know, 12 would be a short leader, 15, 18, 20 foot leaders with dries. Uh, on lakes, we tend to fish three fly setups with oh, 15 to 18 foot leaders again. Uh, nymphing, we're all using 20 to 22 foot leaders. Um, there are some regulations there that we can't get longer in competition. But uh, So leaders, I mean, we could talk for two hours about leaders if we want. But yeah, this, one, of the, one of the people asked about a, a mono rig, like... Why why would you need a fly line mm -hmm. uh, for for euro nymphing versus just using a mono rig if if your line's never out the end of your rod basically? Mm, I see. Well, my line is out the end of my rod often because I usually use about a uh, you know twenty foot leader. Mm -hmm. So my fly line is out the rod almost all the time. Uh, you know when I'm fighting a fish it wouldn't be, and sometimes at the very end of a drift it wouldn't be. But on most situations I'm starting with line out the rod tip. And the reason I like a line is I like handling it. I like managing fly line. When I'm stripping in line, I like managing the fly line. When I'm setting the hook and I'm pinching the line against the cork handle, I like having fly line mono for me slips there. Mm -hmm. When I'm fighting fish, I like to strip in the line. I just I don't like a mono for the entire setup. Uh, in competition, that's not legal. You have to have a fly line, so you can't do that for competition purposes. But even if I were if I were not to compete ever again, I would still use a fly line because it's it's just easier to handle, and they're not your typical hundred dollar fly lines. They're 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 fifty bucks or something like that. Yeah. And you're never gonna wear that one now. 
Yeah, it'd be so. hard for you. If you get a level one, you keep cutting them back, so they can yeah. be long. So, I mean, thing. you're going to be able to control those fish a lot better for a long, long time mm -hmm. if you just get one mine. True. Um, talking about the rigs, too, I mean, the, the question I saw a few times is, why why do you need a longer rod for your Olympian? Why can't I just do it with a nine-footer? Yeah. Does one foot really That's make that much question difference? for sure. Yeah, and the answer is, no, you don't need a ten-footer or a ten-and-a-half or eleven-footer. The nine-footer will work. It's just like all things. Um, if we sent you to a medium-sized river with a seven and a half foot rod and said, you know, here's an indicator rig, go mend it, um, you're going to struggle, right? Because some rods are better at things than others. Can you do it? Yes, you could do it. Um, it's just not the best setup for the for that particular rig. So in Euro nymphing, uh, one of the questions we got online or on uh, social media was actually, do I have to have a Euro rod to Euro fish? And you don't. You could use your nine footer. However. When you do that, know that it's going to be harder to handle the long leader. It's going to be stiffer than you want, so you'll probably break some fish off on the lighter flies than you'd like. Uh, casting it is harder because of the stiffness. Um, you're not going to have the reach that you want because it's a shorter rod. You know, there's disadvantages to it. It's best to have, I think, a 10 foot, 10 and a half foot free weight is my preferred you know, weight. Mm -hmm. Four on the heavy end of things, maybe two on the light end of things, but three is kind of that sweet spot. Yeah, you know, and, and Curtis and I, as, as we've kind of uh, started the Euro Nymph more through the years, it really does make a difference when you're throwing a little bit heavier rig where the lot, the flies are what's loading the rod up. It's, it's really hard to do that with a, a, a rod that's right. designed just to cast fly line. Fly line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what else, Lance? What What's the next question you want to tackle that would fit in here? Um, let's see here. What were they talking about? Rigs, maybe tippet lengths and, and distance between flies. So tippet, yeah, that's a big one. Tippet lengths vary. Uh, you know, the backup leader lengths. Usually our leaders are right around double the length of the rod. Um, so that's including tippet. So for me, I run my leader from the fly line down uh, and at the cider and then a tippet ring, and then I just run straight tippet from the tippet ring down. Uh, for me, I usually like about five or six feet from the tippet ring to my first fly, and then a couple of feet to my second fly. So it ends up being a pretty long system. Uh, you could fish them closer together at times, but I find fishing them further apart for, for catches more fish for me most of the time. Uh, we're going to make a lot of generalization type comments to try and answer these questions. And like always, there are, you know, every situation is different. But generally speaking, that would be the truth of the case. Weren't, weren't you telling me at, at one point that if your flies are too close together, the fish can kind of be indecisive on which one of them to eat, if it's going to eat? Or... I think it's possible that way, yeah. I mean, who knows what the fish are thinking, but that's certainly a possibility. Mm -hmm. I find that if you're fishing two flies further apart, I hook two fish at a time a lot more often. The closer they are together, that, that almost never happens. Uh, you can fish different type parts of the water column with one heavier and one lighter. You can do all kinds of things by spacing them out a bit. Them out a bit. I find I snag fish less. You know, whether yeah. you're going to use an indicator rig or a euro rig, the further apart your flies are, the, the less common. You know, if you get a fish to eat it, your top fly especially and your other fly is really close behind and you're just a tiny bit late, the second fly is right there and you get them in the side. So spacing them out just makes it so you don't foul the fish as often. You don't Not get, that it happens so much anyway, but... You don't get everything happens. tangled up in your net as well when the fish takes a death That's a roll. great point. I forget about yeah. that one. Yeah, people ask that all the time. How do you keep your flies from tangling in the net? And part of that is that distance. If the fish can be in the bottom of the net and the other fly is still up near the rim or even over the rim, it's not in there getting all twisted up. That's a great point. And like you can control that when you're, when you're fighting the fish. You can just kind of scoop it with your net and... You're, instead of like managing where the fish is in your net, you're just trying to keep your other fly away from from the, the tangle. Yes. So that's observation from a noob here. There you go. Good stuff. Um, what else? Cider. Cider above the water, someone asks. Yes, most of the time. Unless you're floating the cider, the cider should never touch the water. Mm -hmm. That is my number one focus. You guys have both heard me. <laughs> uh, they're laughing because I'll come back and vent after guiding that. I can I tell my clients at the beginning of the day that I want the cider off the water at 8 a.m., at 10 a.m., at noon, and at 4 p.m. I want the cider off the water. And at 4 p.m., inevitably, I've, already, I've said, get the cider off the water a bazillion infinity times. 
and people just don't do it. I don't understand it. But you don't want the cider to touch the water. The cider's thicker. Um, it takes you out of contact. If it lays on the water, people say, well, I can just lift it back up. You can. But your flies hit the water, uh, start to, to sink, and then you rip them back up. Because they're with water tension, when you lift the top of the leader, you're moving the flies as well. So they start to descend, and then you lift them right back up. So you killed the beginning of the drift. Uh, you're not in contact while that happens as well. Where if you just stop with the rod high, keep the cider off the water, the flies hit, they sink, and as they're sinking, you're in contact with them, and you're fishing from the second they hit the water. Uh, it also aids in getting them down quickly. Uh, there's t lots of times where the fish eat your fly before you can even get set up, so a lot of my clients send it cast out. By the time they've gotten control of the rig, they already had a fish eat, and they didn't even know it. Yeah, it, it's, that's probably one of the toughest things for me when I was starting to get into it was, and still is, that... Uh, that timing from when your flies turn over and go into the water mm -hmm. to if you don't have your act together and you're not in contact and you have to adjust, then by the time you are, it's too late. Right. It's very, you have to be very efficient to getting those, the flies in the water, leader where it should be and in contact with the flies. Right. Huge deal. It's a big deal for sure. Yeah, contact is everything. I mean, that's why we're half the reason we're doing it is for strike protection. So if you're out of contact during the drift, you're yeah. more or less wasting some of your time. You know, and that's that brings up another thing that's on your list here that I think falls right into place is how do you tell when your nymphs are near the bottom and how do you read the cider? Yeah, so somebody mentioned on um, that's kind of a, a you know, cliff notes <clears throat> version of a long question online, but. Uh, how do you read the cider? I mean, you're watching for it to hesitate, stop, you know, move upstream, do anything uh, that's unnatural to the current that the flies are in. So you're just looking for that cider. Look for reasons to set the hook. Same thing I tell my clients. If they're the first one, they would be the first one ever that I'd have to say, you're setting the hook too much if they do it. Because I've never had any clients come anywhere near setting the hook as much as I'd like. They're always hesitant, and you just got to set on everything. Um, until you figure that out, so you figure out how to read that side a little better to set constantly. Um, to get how to tell when the flies are near the bottom, well, there's the obvious one is when they're ticking bottom, right? But you don't really want the flies dragging bottom. So that's kind of a hurdle for people as they're used to fishing split shot rigs, yeah. um, where the shot are contacting bottom and the flies are above or behind the shot either way. They're used to having that contact. Um, with your own nymphing, with the flies being the weight, if your flies are contacting bottom, they're on the bottom, which means they're more likely to snag, which means the fish aren't going to eat them as well because trout don't feed on the bottom much. They're feeding in the drift. Uh, so you want your flies to be down near the river bottom but not on the bottom. So the hard part there is you're going to contact bottom, right? But you should be doing it near the middle or end of the drift, not the entire drift. They shouldn't just be ticking along in most situations. There are some times where that's an advantage. But generally speaking, you can read your cider and know your flies are down deep because the, the cider will be matching the surface current speed as the flies descend. And as they get down into that uh, lower layer of water that's moving slower, suddenly the cider goes slower than the surface. And when the cider goes slower than the surface, then you know that you are in a good place because your flies are right down in that slow layer of water where the trout are doing most of their feeding. And that's the, the kind of in a nutshell, that's how you're reading the cider to know that your flies are down without dragging bottom that's a, that's a good one um so thinking about that you know as as a as a fly tire and I'm, i've got a bunch of different types of flies in my box and, and everything and i'm always trying to come up with a, a different fly or a new fly or when i'm fishing i'm changing flies a lot but what i've realized as i've started to euro nymph the the weight of the fly is probably more important than the actual pattern as far as as far as like you know what you're fishing and i see here instead of how to choose the proper fly um how to choose proper weights i mean they're both important but but explain to us how important it is to have, to have different weights of flies who wrote that uh, weight's not even spelled right what a new w-e-i-g-t-s <laughs> Oh my gosh! It was probably Cheech. Uh, how so? It was not Cheech. <laughs> I repeat, it was not Cheech. Uh, I can't write that. So there's no way to know the proper. I mean, there's when you're new at it, you're not going to be able to just walk up to the river and go, "I need a four mil and a 
two and a half mil bead to get down. It's not possible. Same mm -hmm. process as when you're indicator nymphing. You, when you first throw your, your indicator rig for the first time, <clears throat> you've got to make a decision based on how much weight you need, right? And you're just guessing. And when you first guess, it might be too much weight or it might not be enough. Most times it's not enough. Um, but you're going to get a sixth sense for just your ability to read water and look at the speed and depth of the water and go, I need a three and a half and a two and a half and I'll be fine. And sometimes water, you know, if it's really clear, for instance, sometimes it's harder to gauge depth, so you might need to go heavier. There are all kinds of variables, but generally speaking, uh, you just need to make sure the flies are getting down, contacting bottom now and then, getting that slow layer of water, as we mentioned. And I think you're right, Cheech, you need, uh, it's more important to have the proper weight than it is to have the fly, right? Everybody's concerned about the fly, and the fly makes a difference. We've talked about this a hundred times, but the fly is not the end all. We, we like to blame it on the fly. We didn't have the right fly patterns or whatever. But usually when you're nymphing and there's not a real heavy hatch, you're just searching, you're looking for opportunistic fish. The fly can make a difference, but the presentation, which includes getting it to depth and getting it the right speed, that's 90% you know, of it. Yeah. One, one of our uh, videos that we did fishing high water, you'll see Lance um, where... Curtis has a camera on him, and, Cam and Lance is literally tying on a fly. He's like, I'm just tying on a heavier fly mm -hmm. to get my worm pattern down in the further in the column. And he literally casts out, first cast, boom, fish on. And so it was all about changing the depth. Probably wasn't that different of a fly pattern from no. the others that you were fishing. Yeah, just a heavier, a bigger bead. Yeah, I mean, if you went out with just a handful of, like, red darts and a bunch of different weights and sizes mm -hmm. and a thread Frenchie and weights and sizes, you could probably fish those two flies year-round. Most places you could, yes. I'm talking about Utah because that's the only place I'm allowed to fish. Oh, well, right. most of the places I've been, that's a good combo, too. <laughs> All right. Uh, what else? What Maybe tell us your your favorite flies right now for fishing the Euro stuff. Uh, or actually, there have been several comments on here where people are asking, what's in Lance's chest pack? And we actually filmed that video um, where we're going to show that. But maybe explain to us your your top flies. Hmm. Top flies vary mm -hmm. time of year, but I mean, darts, Frenchies, thread Frenchies. Um, I've been fishing lakes a lot lately, so hard to, you know, lakes are a different situation, but... Uh, Paragons. Uh, what else have I been fishing lately? That's the majority of it, really. That's, that's a, lot, a lot of what I've been fishing. Some sow bugs on our local water, tailwaters. The waltz, the sexy waltz. Sexy waltz has worked have. a little bit, yep. It has, it has. Little rainbow warriors I've caught fish on lately. I saw a video of you catching a fish on a jiggy fat minnow. Yep. That was... Crazy. Jiggy fat minnow. So what happened there, Curtis? I, I don't know if I want to take Lance's word for it. It's on film. It's on film. There's no word. <laughs> if well, you guys don't know what we're talking about, go look up the video. The it's video good. of, what is it called? <clears throat> the uh, we took out the uh, Echo, or sorry, the uh, Recon. Recon. Recon and, and the, the NRX the Plus. NRX Plus. Yeah. yeah. People yeah. are asking about knots a little bit. Maybe we can cover that in a little bit. What do you want to talk about next, Lance? That's a good question. I'm going to try to tweak the audio again, so your audio may go out, but just keep talking. It's okay. going okay. normal. Curtis is going to try to mess with the audio. Do we need to stop this and start nope. it again? No. no. Okay. Good. Audio sounds like it's coming from the camera, not the mic. It is. Yeah. Well, it's coming from the computer. Oh, it's coming from the computer. Mm -hmm. So now your yep. audio's out. No, I'm going. Audio is out. But it's still going. But it's people can yeah. still hear it's us. Interesting. Yep. Yeah, sorry, we're having technical difficulties, but we'll, we'll get through it. Yeah, just keep talking. It's going to sound um, the same as they are. Somebody asked about how you bring a Euro set for steelhead. Well, I've never done steelhead with the Euro rig, but I know people that have. You just fish you know, as light of a leader as you can stand, so gauge that based on the size of steelhead you're going to encounter. I would anticipate maybe a 15-pound butt section, something like that. Thicker cider, and then from the tippet wing down, just the, whatever tippet you, you can get away with, you know, 2x, 3x, if you, if you dare. Yeah, I've never done that either. I, I literally can't 
provide any input on that at all. The thinner the leader butt is, the further away you'll be able to fish. The lighter flies can be, the thinner the tippet is, the faster the flies will get down. Um, but if you're too thin with a big still head, well, you're going to regret that too. So, uh, you know, again, situational depending on still head can be, I see lots of people posting pictures of 20 inch still head and 20 pound still head. So which, you know. Yeah. Use, well, that goes into how, how do you release or how do you land large fish in faster water with that tiny little three weight? Yeah, there was a question about that. They didn't necessarily specific, uh, specifically ask about a three, but just how to release larger trout in fast water. Uh, the three can go in hand in hand with that, though. We we do get asked that question a lot. If I want to catch big fish on a Euro rig, shouldn't I get a five weight or a six weight? And no, I don't think you should um, because your tippet is your, your determining factor there, not the rod. The rod is, and again, we've talked about this in other podcasts and other situations too on our videos, but the rod is your cushion. The tippet is your breaking point. So you can break tippet, uh, you know, you can break off 5X or 4X tippet on a 10 foot two or three weight, no problem. So with that in mind, a four or five or six gives you no advantage tippet wise uh, or fish fighting wise. You're, it's gonna bend deep, but the rod is, but if you learn how to fight fish on that thin, uh, you know, light rod, you just gotta learn to apply a lot of pressure, a lot more pressure in your thinking with that rod that gives and make sure you're using the full flex of the rod and not pointing. Do we get it? I got it. Cool. Fix the audio. And not You'll pointing. You'll notice a market I do the declare audio. that the nerds of the earth shall <laughs> rejoice and be happy. Anyway, proceed, Mr. Egan. And I am blaming the arrow, not the archer in this case. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. anyway, um, the rod is is not a big deal. You, you can use a three weight with big fish is not the problem. So... Uh, then how to, you want to fight fish fast. So the question was in faster water, how do I get them to survive and where do I let them go if the, if the river is really fast? And fast water is actually better for them because it has a lot more oxygen. So your uh, fast water is not a problem. It's just a matter of fighting the fish fast so that they don't get crazy tired and then letting them go with, as quickly as possible. Um, and part of that is Lance uh, pulling the fish directly <clears throat> out of the water through the air Landing it in the net. <laughs> when they're small, yes. With no struggle. Yeah, when they're small. <laughs> when they're small. <laughs> and the hook pops out and it flips the net. Sometimes. Sub maybe 14-inch fish, 13 yeah. smaller inch fish, you can do that if you're getting bigger than that. Well, I do it with 24-inchers You would. myself. Yeah, I do. You would. Yep. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, yeah, yeah. y'all are going to have to turn the audio down now because I'm <laughs> yeah. fix the stupid thing. Oh, cast, they're saying use this audio setting every time. Yeah, well, guess we what? Tried. It's the we tried. We have to start. change the camera setup quite a bit when we film flies here and all that crap. So just so, bear with us. Uh, all right, Lance, start over. <laughs> start over. Yeah. Well, let's see. Cheech got a speeding ticket. No, he got a warning because he was driving a Ford <laughs> that can't keep track of... of Proper the, miles per hour. The trooper said, "You um, you get off because you're awesome. Because you like soccer from Argentina, also known as football. Football argentino. All right. No, we uh, don't really have to start over. I Lance. know. I was just making a joke. Jeez. Uh, what else? What about? Um, is it possible <laughs> to use flies that are too heavy, and maybe talk about fishing with the wind? Because for me, wind is my Euro nymphing kryptonite. Oh. Wind is kryptonite for sure. <clears throat> wind is terrible in all situations for fly fishing, right? Really strong wind. Uh, wind with the Euro rig, especially when you're new, is really challenging. It's when it gets to a certain point, it's challenging no matter what. But uh, if you watch our modern nymphing videos, I think you'll see if you look in the background, most of them are filming. The trees are moving sideways. There, there are ways to manage it. Uh, you want to lessen the amount of leader you have out because the less surface area you have from your rod tip to your flies, the less surface area the wind has to blow. Um, heavier flies can help. Thinner leader helps. Um, just managing that, maybe not leading as much and letting the wind sometimes lead it or keeping the rod low instead of high to keep the leader closer to the water. Um, you know, Time and practice is what's going to help you with that the most, I think. So go fishing on windy days only? No, go fishing whenever possible. <laughs> and here's a little bit of, it's kind of like taking a banana. When you're out on the water, you don't actually say wind. Nope. You say W. W. You do not say the word wind. Spanish. Not even in Spanish. Can't we say viento. We never said it in Spanish. Nope. So just 
just saying that's that's one of those things that you have to be very cognizant of. Um, so one person in much of a clarification says, with a long leader, 20 to 25 feet, and your 6 to 8 feet of tippet attached to a tippet ring, seems to me, I think he meant to put, like the fly line never gets out of the guide, so why does your fly line matter if you never see it? Well, you don't have clothes quite right. Well, the leader with tippet is about 20 or 22 feet, so your flies are there, so you can shorten that by about... 12 feet <laughs> yeah and then you're gonna have fly line come into play and um, that that brings up a question about tippet rings i've heard people think that every time you have a junction where your triple surgeon's knot is and a tag end mm -hmm. is coming off that you use a tippet ring for that and just like clinch knots on each side you could mm -hmm. so explain to us why you don't why I don't, because it tangles more for me using the tippet ring there. So I only use a tippet ring on my Euro setups at the end of the cider. So I like to go, my cider is a little bit thicker than my tippet, and I find that that junction doesn't uh, link up very well, and I chew up my cider quicker by not having the tippet ring. So I put a tippet ring there, and then I usually, usually use a uni knot at that point, uni knot from the tippet to the tippet ring, and then go down to a triple surgeon's knot. The triple surgeon's, the tag is hanging down at an angle slightly, so that it tends not to twist and tangle as much. When you do a tippet ring down on the, in that place, you have you know line coming to the top and line coming out the side. And for whatever reason, that likes to spin more for yeah. me, and it just tangles. It, it creates more knots. If it doesn't for you, there's no harm in, in using the tippet ring there. Um, it just doesn't work for me, so I don't, I don't use the tippet ring there. And plus, you'll lose a lot of tippet rings that way. That's good for business. You put the tippet rings there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what am I doing? Um, here's an interesting one. Hot spots and colors of beads on flies. I think the question on that one was, why would you get different colors of beads when you can just di get different colors of dubbing for hot spots? So maybe... What's your yeah? I mean, what's your strategy on hot spots? There's no right or wrong there. I mean, I have beads that are hot spots. I have dubbing that's hot spots. I have thread that are that I use as hot spots. There's no right answer there. Do what you like. That's why you get to tie your own flies. <laughs> Lance, you're supposed to tell the people exactly what they need to do to catch fish every. Cast. I just did, every uh, time. Oh, geez, see, you guys can't be asking Lance that kind of stuff because here, here's a. Good question that we I see a lot. Do you feel or see more strikes? Ooh. Feel yeah. or see more strikes? Uh, see for sure. Yeah. You should be seeing. You should be reading the cider to where you're seeing strikes <clears throat> uh, long before you're feeling them. You can feel them and you will feel them, but by the time you feel them, the fish is also feeling the bend of your rod and you. So you're going to miss a lot of fish if you're feeling them. You'll catch fish that way, but I would argue you should be seeing the strike on your cider long before you're feeling it. Yeah. Read the cider read the cider i struggle with that i i want to do the i'm gonna feel a strike like a bass fisherman before i set the hook <laughs> yeah that's why i don't catch any fish uh there was another let's see how long is the tag on your yeah that's a surgeons? good one how long is the tag on the triple surgeons i usually start at about six inches yeah you need a little bit of uh cushion to change flies. change flies if you make it too shorter tangles less right but uh I like to have a little bit of distance between the knot and the fly too. It makes the fly, it allows it to drift more natural. Um, if you make it too long, it tangles more often. Yeah. Six, you know, maybe seven inches max is kind of the happy medium. I, I, I started about six, hoping that it gets more like the four and a half, five when I'm really dialed with flies and weights. Yeah. And that's about perfect for me. Yeah. So the other question about about the tag sec the tag ends is do you use a clinch or a davy or what's your preferred knot and why to tie your flies on uh, i usually use just a clinch unimproved a uh, regular <clears throat> clinch knot when i get really thin tippet then sometimes i'll change it to a uni most of the time a uh, trily knot at times you know something that's a little stronger but you know we're talking six and a half seven x before i'm doing that Usually six x five and a half five x. I'm just using a, a clinch knot. Works great. Um, what else? What's next? Oh, this, there's a couple rapid fire ones. Do you tend to oversize your beads on jig flies? Yes. I mean that's sometimes. Yeah. One strategy. You. Yeah, I use jig hooks for sure yeah. because I can because I can use a broad range of bead sizes. But you don't always want you don't only want heavy flies. You need light flies too. Yeah. Um, I find when I go to Europe, I'm, I'm often amazed. We fish a lot of smaller flies, I would call them around here. 
um, not micro, but smaller than they do in Europe. You know, that's why all the European hooks are available down to like size 16 and no smaller. Yeah. Uh, but when I get there, I find I often need 12s and 14s, and I have those, but I have them as bombs for our local water, and I want 12s and 14s that are light, yeah. uh, still weighted, but not as weighted. So, you know, heavy is not always great, but you do you do have the advantage with the jig hooks of having a broad range of, of, of bead sizes on there, and we do tend to tie them pretty, you know, crazy heavy sometimes yeah, in like small a fly four millimeter on a 16 yeah four millimeter bead on a 16 looks really ridiculous <laughs> but they like it yeah i mean again it's about weight a big part of it like we said so somebody put a two question or two word question perfection loop question mark what's the question do you use a perfection no, i don't use loops at all my comment to him is watch this. Lance loves loops. <laughs> I hate loops. A perfection loop, a loop to loops connection on a Euro rig is. Uh, it's the worst thing ever. You might as well not fish because you have to have your connections going in and out of the guides all the time. And a loop to loop connection just hangs up in the guides. We've said it a million times and we'll keep saying it. But the first thing that I do on all my fly lines when I get a new line is cut the blasted loop off. I hate those things. Yep. They're and made tie, for people that can't tie knots. That's right. why they're tie there. Tie a nail knot or a needle nail knot, <laughs> Correct. typically speaking. And that's right. another question. And let's see. <laughs> I can hear that. Good. <clears throat> okay come on excellent connection that's the weird part is that we're still getting comments yeah okay oh that's so close oh look it's gone we back we're back we're back so they we, said that it cut out right when Lance was talking about loops. <laughs> loops? So, That's why you back. do not use You loops. don't use loops. Oh, jeez. The IRS is watching. The, yeah. The Russians and uh, everybody is checking out your loops, so don't use loops. The loop makers are watching this, and they linked up uh, with NSA and shut us down. <laughs> so uh, in a nutshell. That was, that was not the Internet. That was, that was a loops. locking piece of software. And also, we have like 13 thumbs downs. I would implore of you fine people out there to I reverse those clear. thumbs downs and give us a thumbs up on this YouTube video. We're doing this out of the kindness of our hearts. It's just the haters. It's all good. It's all good. All right. So, so. loops. You don't want loops. A loop-to-loop -loop connection on your fly line to your leader, whether you're fishing a 9-foot-5 weight, a 10-foot-6 <clears throat> weight, or a 10-foot-3 weight. You don't want the loop. No. Nope. I think they were also asking about using loop knots to attach your flies. Mm. Well, you could do that if you want. I haven't found in my fishing that makes any difference at all, but I know lots of people would disagree with me. And it, is that because you're using such thin tippet that it's flexible enough to make the flies move? Mm. That means flies move. Flies Is that move. what they do? Yeah, that's what you do. Do that again. <laughs> okay, stop. Now I'm getting uncomfortable. All right. Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't think, for me, I can't tell a difference even when I'm fishing 20 pound test and big flies. I just don't, I don't, I can see sometimes the difference in the way the fly moves. I haven't, I fished in boats with me on one end, another guy on the other end. One of us using a loop knot and the other one not, and it doesn't seem to make any difference at all. If it does in your head, that's do a big it. deal. Yeah, that's why you That's do a big it. deal. In my non-scientific testing, I'm not convinced that it makes any difference. But like I said, lots of people would disagree. I hear all kinds of people say that are streamer experts that say you have to do a loop knot. Then try it. <laughs> uh, like this guy? Uh, I use loop knots with streamers. All. I find that it makes a difference on the articulated trout slider hmm. when I'm using like 2X tippet and it's you know pretty gnarly tippet. With mm -hmm. that loop, it just makes the fly... Ooh. It's just one man's opinion. Yeah, one man's opinion. That being said, I think did we? I think we skipped the part where we talked about clinch versus Davy knot because now there are two other questions about that. What about them? What was? Yeah. What? What do? What do we prefer to tie the flies on with? I prefer a clinch. 
But clinch. a Davy Knot's fine. If it works for you, it slips for me, so I, I don't like it very much. But I know lots of people that use it well. Uh, you know, knots are like tip it to me. Some people hate brand X and love brand Y, and others are the exact opposite. If you're using something and it works well for you, perfect. Yeah, yeah. There's no reason to change it. If you're losing flies because your knot's breaking, well, consider a different tippet or a different knot. Clinch or improved clinch? Uh, both, again, if they're working, but it's been proven that the unimproved clinch, the regular clinch knot is generally speaking stronger in most fly fishing, you know, leader materials and diameters. You don't, you can skip the extra step. It, it cinches up better. I don't know what you want to call it. It like welds together better without the improved. It's not, the improved clinch is unimproved. I think it makes it so you can't get it quite as tight. It doesn't yeah, cinch right. as well. You're right. <clears throat> You sometimes so. have to adapt the number of turns on the clinch, right? Sometimes people with thinner tippets especially don't put enough turns, and then they're breaking flies off. That's that's yeah. the real deal. But, uh, yeah, for me, again, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But if you're looking between the two and you're going to do – you're trying to decide one or the other, I would try a clinch. Yeah, I really like the clinch knot for fly fishing. I bass fish quite a bit, and that's when I get creative with different knots. Yeah, and then a Palomar is pretty different tough things. to beat. Yeah, Palomar is really good, but I wouldn't do that on like 6X and a Nymph. Uh, it's really strong. I've done it, but it uh, uses a lot of tipping. Yes, yeah. sir. <laughs> Doubling it over. It's the strongest knot for sure. Um, what else? Someone says, are are you all – let me try to say this in, in uh, you Uh-oh. all. Are y'all fishing streamers right now or sticking to that euro on that tail water? Uh, well, That's probably not. Look at the video we just posted. <laughs> We're doing yeah. both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the streamers can be really good on a euro rod. Shocker. Or, and there's not uh, even really a streamer season. Just throw streamers yeah. whenever you want. Yeah. Streamers They're work fun. all the time. Yeah. How many turns on your clinch knot? Depends on the diameter of tippet and the size of the eye of the hook. I do N minus 12 <clears throat> divided by 2, where N nerd is alert. the number of fish I catch. <laughs> Come in. We got a nerd alert here. <laughs> yep. Ten twenty two over here. <laughs> Curtis <laughs> Fry nerd alert. Nerd alert. Do declare. Smallest fly you fish. Cheech, what's the smallest fly you fish? Smallest fly I fish on a Euro rig? No, it just, just doesn't say that, just in general. Smallest fly I fish is a 32 on an old TMCO 518. Dang, there you go. So sometimes that, and maybe it's just that I, it's in my head that that works. But Curtis and I have had days on, they like say, the Green sometimes. River where it's it's really, yeah. really good. But on a Euro rig, I, I rarely go under a 16 anymore yeah 22s for me about as small as i get i don't fish them often either i fish mostly 16s and larger but <clears throat> when you have to yep um any advantage <clears throat> of tying jig head nymphs upside down or opposite on tying the standard straight hooks meaning wing case on the hook point side uh you're worrying about this way too much nymphs do not drift with one orientation i'm being harsh here but there's there are facebook battles that go on about this and you're <laughs> the fish are not down there going nope i can't see that one's wing case not gonna yeah. eat it <laughs> oh i mean i fell into that i i started tying a bunch of like jig style stone flies and if you've ever tried to tie a wing case on the hook other side, side on the hook mm-hmm. side it'll make you go crazy yeah it's not worth it and normally i would argue most flies are best tied in the round meaning they don't even have a wing case yeah um, yeah I say that, and some of my flies have a wing case, so I'm, you know, talking out both sides of my mouth here. But uh, I don't think the fish really care. And uh, explain that to us. What does it mean to be tied in the round? Because it's an it's an awesome way to tie flies. I've started to do it a lot. Uh, in a nutshell, just tying the flies so that it looks the same from any any you know angle of of sight. So if the fish sees it from the side, from underneath, from the top, from the other side, it all looks the same. Yep. Um, uh, there's a couple questions. Uh, I think he's asked twice the smallest fly or he's ta- asking about the San Juan and, and that's one I know people traditionally use really really small stuff mm-hmm. but I, I, I really feel on the uh, if you're going to Euro Nymph you don't necessarily I would be uh, I would suggest that you try bigger flies with that method you yeah. don't have to go that small I mean, yeah or you can team two flies put a heavier fly and yeah. a tiny one fish a heavy fly on the point and a tiny little you know zebra midge or thread midge or whatever on a yeah. tag end that's just above it there's lots of ways to do it, and there and again, there's the Euro rig is not the best in every single right. situation. It is, however, the uh, you know, the thing I find is people want to come up with reasons that they shouldn't do it, and I, <laughs> and I know I, I was the same way, right? It's it's not you don't want to try something new necessarily, but once you try it, 
Uh, if you haven't tried urine nymphing, once you try it, you're going to find that you're going to use it in a whole lot more situations than you ever imagined. Uh, it opens up all kinds of water types that you didn't, you would not have thought you could fish with nymphs. Uh, that said, it's not always the best technique. Yeah. Wind, we talked about wind earlier. Crazy heavy wind, not very good for urine nymphing. A little wind, a little breeze, some gusts, no big deal. Uh, 30 mile an hour sustained, pretty tough to urine nymph. Yeah. It's not for everything, but there are times and places where it's the best thing, and it's times and places where it's not the best setup. Yep. Yeah. Um, we haven't talked a lot about the competitive side of things. So how did you get into competition fishing, Lance? If you want to move into that, if there are any other questions. We started with that, but you were probably chatting with uh, <laughs> not hot babes because I know who you were chatting. Like Kelly Barnes is not a hot babe. Well, but, uh, that or, or – uh, Maybe just start going down that road of answering some of the, the questions. Oh, now you're making come. it serious. I was trying to make a joke. Don't don't joke with me. My bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I Can mean, you write him up, Matthew the Chicken Thief? Yeah, Matthew there. will He's get right listening. on that. Right. So what do you want me to go into? Not competitions, but... No, competitions, like... How they work or how... Yeah, just from step A to B, like, how does it work with a competition... Maybe how would someone get into it if they wanted yeah, to? Yeah, that's a good one. We had questions about that. So how do you get involved with fly fishing competitions? You go to flycomps.com and you sign up for a membership, and then you get uh, you get emails about the upcoming regionals, and they're open to everybody, but they, they are limited space, and they fill up very fast. So as a heads up, if you're wanting to get into fly fishing competitions, if they say that registration opens at 6 p.m. on you know, whatever, December 3rd, you need to be there at 558 and logged in and ready to go because most of the competitions fill up certainly within 24 hours and a lot of them will fill up in like 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, it's there. You only have so much water, so many beats that can be set. Uh, so they fill up really fast. That said, they're open to everybody. If you sign up and you get a spot, there's new people at every competition we go to. Uh, it's good fun, good way to, to test your skills and, uh, how they work, they're generally four to five sessions, three hours each session, and you have different venues. So uh, you would maybe fish you know, three rivers and two lakes, for instance, and every angler will fish one beat or one, you know, one, if, you're, if it's a lake and you're fishing in a boat, you're gonna fish each of the lakes twice and then one beat on each of the three different rivers. And at the end of every session, you are in a group. So the end of, if, if our group was you know, three of us are in a group. If you go to the world championships, there's usually about 30 people in your group. If the three of us and 27 others are in a group, at the end of the first three-hour session, if Cheech catches the most fish, that would never happen. Um, well, it might, actually. He's pretty dang good. I'm teasing him. But stalker if he caught rainbows? The, if he caught the most stalker rainbows, um, which I don't think that's a particular skill of yours, but... Uh, <laughs> I outfished Lance once on a lake full With, of stalker rainbows. It was rainbows. not full. It had it had one stalker rainbow. And there you were found no it. other types of fish well, in there. It was a half a stalker rainbow. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't full of anything. That's why we only well, caught one fish between three of us. I still outfished you. Anyway. For part of the day. Go on with these getting on, sessions. Moving on. So if Cheech caught the most fish in that session or the most total centimeters of fish, big fish are worth more <clears> points than small fish, then he gets first place. And then at the end of, the, that's called a placing point, you also get fish points. So you get points for every centimeter of length of fish you catch. The fish have to be generally eight inches or longer to count. So that's, that, that debunks a myth that you're just trying to catch as many small fish as possible. That's yeah. not true. Yeah, everybody has these, uh, these generalizations they make about competitions. And it, generally when I'm looking online at people that hate competition fishing, number one, they've never done it. Number two, they know absolutely nothing about it. Well, I've been tight line nymphing for years and years, the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing, I know. You learned it back like in the 50s. I've heard that one too. That was a question, how is that different? How is what different? Tight line. Well, I don't know. It depends on what you call tight line, right? I guess so. Tight line, to me, tight line nymphing versus your own nymphing. Tight line nymphing we've done with split shot. You know, if you're talking, to me, like Joe Humphrey's yeah. setup would be tight lining. Shorter leader, stouter rod, nine footer. You know, Sometimes nine, a spinning rod. Nine, ten foot, twelve foot leader. Yeah, it could be a spinning rod. Split shot, usually on the point. You know, on the bottom with flies on droppers. That's yep. what I would call tight lining personally. Yep. Now I hear other people call euro nymphing tight lining. To me, that's I don't care what you call it, but that makes it uh, uh, foggy. It muddies the water a little bit. To me, they're a little different. Um, 
that's the difference to me. Euro nymphing, we're using 20 foot leaders, longer rods, lighter rods, thinner leaders, no split shot, just weighted flies. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we, we got sidetracked. You were talking about the end of the session. It's the size. Total size of centimeter, total centimeters gets the first place. So if you got first place in the first session and then we go to the second session, we all fish for three hours, and that time Curtis gets first place. And the third one, I get first place. And on and on. At the end of the five sessions, you have two scores. You have placing points, which is your placing in the session. So in, the, in those three sessions, we all had a first place, right? But then later sessions, we might have come in 20th place. So at the end of the five sessions, you have placing points that you want to be low. So you want a you know, perfect score in a five session comp is five points because you want all five sessions. And then you want your fish points to be high because you get more points for total centimeters of fish. At the end of the comp, if there's a tie in placing points, fish points break that tie. Um, so that's how they work. They're generally a mix of lakes and rivers. Again, you're not the, nobody in the competition tells you you have to fish nymphs, you have to fish drives, you fish whatever you think is best in your water type to catch the most fish. So that's how you win one of these competitions. That's how and I one. think one thing about competition, for whatever, I, again, I don't understand why people would bag on something that they've never done or really know. Because we're afraid of what we don't understand. That's true, why. True. I would say, worst case, you become a better angler. Yeah, I mean, because and it's competition. And and let's not let's not beat around the bushes. I mean, it, fly fishing competitions not for everybody, and now it's not for everybody. It's like for hardly yeah. anybody, I, you know, most people are not interested in it. That's fine. There's no problem right. in not being interested in it. Uh, but I hear people get online and start bashing it, like, you know, it's going to ruin the sport, and it does this and does that. And you're like, did ski racing ruin skiing? Did yeah. mountain bike racing ruin mountain biking? Like you can still go fishing, you can still go mountain biking and enjoy the heck out of it. Just because somebody does a mountain bike race doesn't ruin it. I don't, I don't understand that. But well, and I think the other element that the people don't understand and and how skilled you guys are that are on like Team USA and who are who do well in these competitions, you know, you're taking a guy like like Lance or Devin or or Josh or any of those guys on on the on the team. They're going and fishing a place they're largely unfamiliar with. They're going to have to dial in that section of river and figure out where the fish are, how to catch them. But not only that, but find the most efficient way and come up with a strategy to fish that section of river that they have. So that's a whole other element of, of fishing that like you don't think about. So the guys that just say, oh yeah... I kill them when I go out on the river. I could totally go into one of those competitions and and do well. I've I've heard I've never competed myself, but I've heard that that's one of the things that that can really mess with you when you're you're trying to to do these comps as well. Is that accurate, Lance? Yeah, I mean, there's always you get somebody at every other comp that's you know talking heat that's never done it, and they're gonna they're the reason that uh, Team USA doesn't do very well because they're not on the team, right? Because they're going to kill everybody, and inevitably they end up like 20th out of 24 or 24 out of 24. Uh, we get people that show up to competitions and literally don't catch a single fish the entire competition, and the person that won maybe caught 60 or 40. It's a huge difference, and we all start at the same. I mean, when you're when you're new at competition fishing and you're going against people that have done it for a decade, you should. I think you should expect to get your butt kicked. Um, you know, for me domestically. I don't, I don't usually get my butt kicked. It happens now and then, but I go to the world championships and the talent level is different. And I've been fortunate enough to get a bronze medal once I finished sixth place once. And most of my other finishes are in the top 25 with a couple of really poor finishes. I think one in the seventies and one in the nineties. And you come away from those 70 or nineties. I went one year from being third in the world to, I can't remember which one was which, but third in the world to either 70th, you know, 70 something or 90 something place. And when you think, yeah, I finally cracked the code, right? I, I just meddled. And then the next year you go and just realize I have so much more to learn. We, uh, the competition thing pushes you. It makes you, it creates a measuring stick that we don't have in fly fishing, right? If you go fishing with your buddies and you catch more fish than your buddies, well, cool. Then you're the best fisherman am among your buddies. But that doesn't tell you how good you are relative to anybody else on planet Earth. And so the competition you know, sometimes in a rude way, it makes you realize you're you're not as skilled as you thought you were, and we have lots of opportunities, and we all have that. 
that's the great thing about fly yeah. fishing is we're all going to learn it the rest of our lives. Electroshocking a river will also do that. That will also humble <laughs> you real quick. <laughs> yep. To realize how many fish are really in the river and you're just kind of passing over those. So in a competition, there's a, here's a question. Um, of all the different styles of flies and techniques you can use, what, what do you think is, is the responsible for the most fish or does it change quite a bit? What was the first part of that? What it was like dries versus streamers versus yeah. Oh, which technique? Yeah, yeah which I mean, technique? Oh, nymphing. You said sometimes it, it dries like in Bosnia was the top. But. Yeah, I, I mean nymphing. I think is just by sheer percentages. If ni- if trout do more than ninety percent of their feeding yeah. in rivers below the surface, nymphing generally is going to be the best situation, right? But uh, the best way to catch numbers of fish. But it just doesn't always work out that way. If there's hatches or the fish have been really pressured. Um, you know, last year in Italy, in my last session, I caught more fish than everybody previously had caught on the, on the beat. Um, I think, I don't remember exactly, but I think I fished at last. I think I caught almost 10 more fish than the closest previous competitor. And I did it by fishing streamers. I caught every fish I caught on streamers. Um, I tried nymphs a little bit. I didn't catch any. I'm sure that everybody else had nymphed it to death and they hadn't seen streamers yet. So I caught a bunch of fish on streamers. So sometimes in a competition situation, thinking out of the box and thinking about water types or techniques that other people aren't doing is really an advantage. Yeah. One person has an interesting question. So you fish Utah quite a bit. How does that stack up to other areas that you've competed? Uh, Utah is awesome. Uh, depends on where you're talking about com- where I've competed. Cause some places are really dire and some are really cool. Um, more often than not, when I'm at a world championship, let's say I'm out of country Uh, I usually kind of long for our local waters. We have it really good here, uh, which we don't need to advertise because we don't need anybody else moving to Utah. (laughs) We have plenty of people migrating here as is. But but it's really good here. You know, the Rocky Mountain West is a great place to be, whether you're in Utah, Idaho, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, whatever. That's another thing that when you're competing, you're sacrificing a lot of your good fishing time to maybe go somewhere that's not as good as what you're used to. But you're just... You're putting your skill on the line. So if if the winning beat only is five fish in X amount of hours and you can go to your local river and catch bigger, better, more quality fish in, mm-hmm. in less time, yeah. you know, if that's what you're in it for, maybe comp- competitions aren't for you, you know. Yeah. So now keep in mind too. I mean, people say, why would you want to spend your time competition fishing? And, and that's a fair question. But most of the competitors have jobs or you know life situations that allow them they're not i guess most people that say that fish 10 12 15 times a year and most of the competitors i know are fishing 100 to 200 days a year so it you know taking a week to go competition fish isn't really putting a dent in their everyday fishing yeah i agree one of the things that i like best about competitions seeing as i've never done one is when lance comes back and he comes back from the competitions and he has the stories of josh grapham no, I just joking. he doesn't. Uh, but he has like the strategies and what worked and different things that you learn mm-hmm. and kind of how it, it. You know, there's always something you. I feel you take away from a comp. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And then he shares it with us, and we go and start tying flies and crazy. Yeah, we're always. I mean, as a team, we're always looking for takeaways. We're trying yeah. to learn and get better. Look, when we started this, I mean, I, I did my first world championship at two thousand in two thousand six, and believe me, then I was one of those guys that's like. We've never meddled because I was and not really. I didn't think that, but I but I was pretty confident that I was going to do well, right? Yeah. And I got there and I clawed and scratched and ended up in twenty fourth place. Um, I won one session. I got a real I can't remember exactly what I did on lake, but maybe a third place ses- session on a lake. I did pretty well. I also blinked my very first world championship session. Um, I have a good excuse because the water master blew out the river on us like ten minutes into the session. Sure. Um, so nobody caught a fish in that session, but. But I blinked it as well. Had I have caught one or two fish in that session, I probably would have meddled. Not probably. I would have meddled. Uh, but being 24th, I came away from that going, I got work to do, right? There are, there are lots of things I need to learn. Uh, so we work as a team every year. We're, we, we have you know pre and post meetings. We, have, we post notes. We share everything with our teammates as far as which flies are working what was best technique wise. We do that between sessions. We do it after the competition. We're always trying to learn and get an edge. Yeah. Yeah. And the, 
uh, above and beyond that too, just the the relationships that you build with really other top notch anglers around the world. Like you came back from fishing with Pablo with mm -hmm. just lots of good info that you were able to impart to us. So we benefited from that as well. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the, the fringe benefit of competition fishing. Even if you don't want to do it, if you're listening to us talk about Euro nymphing, you know, that's from competition. Yeah. That didn't happen, you know, uh, without We didn't just go out onto the stream and figure all this out. No, it, it came, it, it's, it came about because of rules, you know, crazy rules that are in the international uh, FIPS is what it's called. The International Organization for the World Championships has these strange kind of stringent rules as we see them here in the U.S. because we all come from an indicator background, and that's the only reason we have your own nymphing. Wait, I call them bobbers. You do. <laughs> doesn't matter what you call them. They're the same thing. Okay. Uh, do we have any others we're that we need to? About. We're running a little long, but we well, did have a little. If we cut out the. We have a little kill time in the part. middle. Yeah. I don't know. What else have we not covered? <laughs> Somebody had a good comment. The commercial break brought to you by. <laughs> <laughs> Diet Coke and Dr. Pepper, Dr. Crocs, Dr. Pepper. New Balance, and <laughs> Ford Raptors. I, well, then Haller Brothers. Brothers. Haller Brothers. You need a free Ford Raptor. I need a free Ford Raptor and also 3X sure Clothing happen. Worldwide <laughs> and the companies that make such clothing. Um, mm, 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 what else? Um, somebody was asking about why or would you choose a 10-foot or a 10-and-a-half-foot rod and why? Why? Mm, either one. Uh, I fish 10s most of the time, but I have some of both. I mean, I always argue that... If you like a ten and a half, that's really cool because they're great. But you can negate that by taking a six-inch step forward, and you <laughs> now have a ten and a half foot rod. But there, I mean, your your uh, one foot difference is a big difference. I think going from a nine to a ten gives me more. Going from a ten to an eleven gives me more reach. At some point, though, you get. I think the longer the rod is, the the uh, harder it is to be accurate, and the more it fatigues you, the more leverage you have on it out away from your arm and your shoulder. 10 footers are kind of the happy medium for me. I have kind of freakishly long arms. That's why I can slap Cheech upside the head from where I'm sitting here. If you're on a ladder. Whatever, ankle biter. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I, either way, you can't go wrong. 10, 10 and a half, no problem. 10 foot eight, great. Uh, when I start getting into 11 footers, I haven't yet fished an 11 footer that I love, but I know lots of people that have them, they love them. So get as long as you can comfortably fish. Here's a good one for the preacher voice. Guys, come on, Euro Nump when there's beads, flesh flies, and pistol peats. <laughs> All right, whatever. Uh no, that's that's uh that's the answer. Um somebody asked about your landing net setup. He said they that he knows it's on a zinger. Yes. That is on a zinger. It is it's on a, zinger. On a special it's a gear zinger. Keeper, gear keeper net, net retractor. retractor. We sell them on store.flyfishfood.com. And the Fraybill net is very lightweight. It's very durable. If you see Lance's from the videos, it looks like it's been dragged behind a, it a has. super fast driving Ford F-150 <laughs> on a mountain road. But it's it's beat up. It's caught a lot of fish. But they're, they're very durable, very lightweight nets and cheap. They're like, what? 27 yeah, bucks super something cheap also on the store there not rich people stuff no. as we would say what else okay do we have any of those up there we didn't touch that we really need to um mm. I got we did one. have a question about uh 10 foot four weight mm -hmm. versus a three weight mm -hmm. and it may be due to uh, you know one of the comments we had in the video that we were fishing that to uh, nrx plus four weight 10 footer mm -hmm. um doesn't necessarily mean that four weight 10 footers in general are not great for your nipping some are designed and you may like them <clears throat> right that one wasn't particularly uh, a spectacular euro nipping rod correct it's a good 10 an excellent 10 foot rod yeah they i mean in that case loomis nrx 10 foot four we're talking about they didn't design it as a euro right, rod exactly. they designed it as who knows what i, I think an all-purpose rod to yep. me that's a standout indicator nymphing oh, rod yeah. it threw the, the double streamers, streamers you know small insane. streamers yeah threw those really really well oh um, is that when i was in mexico and you guys fished without me yeah, yeah you with were just, my fly we just waited you were probably on the beach trying to find your shorts we were catching fish i'm uh, protesting i'm not listening to this conversation please do that'd be nice <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I mean, that rod is an awesome rod. It's a little stiff for your own nymphing. It's not soft enough to load really easy. It won't protect really light tippets yeah. as well as I would like, but it's not designed for that. It's designed, to me, I would use it for dry dropper, for streamers, for indicator nymph, or even uh, I would use that on, as like a Green River medium dry fly rod. Yeah. Um, you know, bigger river yeah. from a drift boat. Uh, it casts really well. It's a really strong rod. But there are some four weights that are designed softer tips. There are. So there are some four weight euro rods. They're generally on the heavier end of things, but yeah. they, there are some four weights. Yeah. You're right. Um, what else? That's, should, we're pretty that much there. Yeah. I think I mean, there's so tons of questions I we didn't get to. But post your comments below if you have other questions. We'll probably do another. Uh, version of this part two and maybe kind of dial in some of the questions a little maybe further. even a recap of the worlds oh that would be good there That'd aren't grayling one. down there so it should be pretty good <laughs> <laughs> we hope so <laughs> okay There's tasmanian devils though there all right are, are those wombats so don't wallabies <laughs> wombats and, and wallabies all right don't forget to push the thumbs up on this one last time give us a thumbs up on this youtube video we also need you to subscribe and ring the bell. And, yeah, you can for notifications. And also, this will be uploaded to your favorite podcast platform within a couple days. Thanks to Big B, Feather Flinger, Brandon Mena himself. Brandon Big Mena B. himself. He rips the audio. Apologize for the audio issues slash whatever, but you know what? Also, it's all right. happy Thanksgiving because we probably won't talk to you no. until after that. Lance True. is heading to Worlds. I'm heading to San Diego. Oh, and the busiest weekend of the year is what? <laughs> Well, that was uh, July, uh, Black Friday. Uh, July 4th, probably. And you guys fished while I was in Mexico, and I'm working Ooh. all of Black Friday. So if you're in Utah. Listen, he's complaining. I was in on, Mexico. On Friday <laughs> or Saturday. Oh, it was not the fun part. <laughs> oh, of come on. There's no, there's no such thing as an unfun fun part of Mexico. But if you're around, stop by. Maybe bring us some Snickers bars and hot dogs or something, because we won't have time to, to leave the shop. Yeah, and Cheech needs to quit raiding my sugar supply, so bring him some treats, will you? Yeah. Yes. See, this is how it's done, boys. All right. Well, we super appreciate you guys listening along. Um, we still have until episode 35 to get the audio and video stuff to, to run seamlessly, so you can't fault us for that. Um, but And also thanks to Lance for sharing his knowledge on this. Oh, sure. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everyone.